So this is the afternoon crowd that I need to wake up, huh? Is that what Elbon said that, right? He was, he was fortunate to be in the morning. I don't agree. This is the best crowd. You're the best ones here this time of day. All right, so <clears throat> I, as I've been sitting here uh, listening to a lot of presentations, I think I've changed this presentation about six times. Because I'm thinking, well, I should talk about this, or I should talk about that, whatever. But I think I'll stick to my standard protocol as to what I was going to talk about. And it's going to be <clears throat> to first characterize, show you um, what the primary spacecraft is that we are underway on, and how they look, and what their capacities are, and, and how they look if they're joined together. And, um, and then to talk about the, our response to the broad area announcement <clears throat> as to how we can accommodate uh, a, a, another uh, module on ISS, and then some benefits that that has that are, that are peculiar to our particular spacecraft. It has additional capacities uh, that enable other kinds of things. Then I'm going to describe <clears throat> what our chronology is going forward for the next four years so that uh, we have a chance to actually produce two of our 330s in 2020 for launch. So we, our goal is to ship those out of Las Vegas uh, in, in the year 2020 and launch them in 2020. I'll talk maybe a little bit about financial aspects of things. Uh, Dr. Blaine gave a great uh, synopsis here, I think, of the business case in, in, a, in a rough kind of context. So some of that, uh, the markets and those kinds of things, I probably don't need to cover too much. But, um, and looking forward to any questions and so forth. So, um, ah, okay, so <clears throat> this is our standard. This, this constitutes a standalone space station. It needs no other support, <clears throat> no other modules, no other uh, kinds of facilities. And so the, the goal here is to sustain life for long periods of time uh, and even to possibly be uh, um, untended, uh, some say human tended, but the, the untended for maybe, maybe a long period of time, maybe as much as a year or more, maybe two years. But our, our focus is on LEO. And so we have, as you can see here, um, we've attached the SpaceX Dragon to, uh, to this because the forecast is that they are probably the ones that will be in operation in, uh, first. And um, this is an awful lot about money as to how low can you get the cost down to the ultimate consumer. And all of the business models that we've put out um, are antiquated as of the time that these rockets start to recover reliably their first stage. It makes a, a sea change of difference in costs. Uh, in, in along that same subject of cost, <clears throat> whatever we charge a client, whether it's for um, their own travel to the station or some payload, uh, about 80% of that is connected to transportation. So we're on the very small minority of the cost spectrum of things. Um, and we have, however, <clears throat> a significant ability to, to divide and, and parcel out uh, cost to accommodate uh, quite, a, quite a vast array of pocketbooks, maybe even as low as five figures uh, for certain kinds of payloads. So we have um, two airlocks on this spacecraft. One is a very large airlock for EVA purposes. It is two-chambered airlock. Um, we have a, a ecosystem system and environment that is our goal to sustain six people. That's a crowd. We don't really expect that. Even if you're changing out crew, we don't expect that. So if you, if you uh, bound two of these together, dock two of these together, in theory, you would have enough for maybe seven of our, our, our key, uh, I think our, our, our best scenario is to have uh, not quite one of our own crew per client. And maybe it's a professional astronaut from another country, or, or maybe it's a tourist. And so we're looking at maybe three of our own astronauts for four clients if, it, if it's uh, more of a human kind of mission. We have about 28 different uh, direct reference missions, which is what do you do with these structures? So it's really quite a wide bandwidth of, of uh, bless you, of opportunities of what you can do. And because this is uh, 330 cubic meters, it dwarfs anything else that's around or that's likely to be built in a while. 
uh, and the size of uh, is directly what, what you can accommodate in terms of variety of potential is directly proportional to what you're talking about. Obviously, an aircraft carrier can do a lot of things, you know, that a that a whaler uh, skiff could not do. So uh, there there is a strong relevancy to you want more volume if you can get it. Uh, and also from a uh, cost standpoint of launch, it would take typically three launches to acquire this kind of volume on a single launch uh, to Leo. Uh, albeit that that launch would be more expensive because it's a, it's a heavy lifter. There is only one rocket at the moment with one fairing type that can accommodate this 57 foot long structure. It is the Atlas 552 uh, stretch fairing. It has not flown before. So we're talking about a series of things here that are, that are one-off situations that are, that are high risk, that are chancy and risky, uh, but we're optimists and we think we can do the spacecraft and uh, we just don't want to have the A part of our menu have problems. The C is okay. We can fix those kinds of things. We don't want any of the A's. Um, so it has terrific capabilities and um, it is a structure that can perform well in LEO or in deep space, uh, be it L1 or cislunar operation, it doesn't really matter. It could be a terrific transporter for whatever on the way to Mars. All right. This is two of them joined together. That's 660 cubic meters. Um, <clears throat> from a business case standpoint, we, our business case is good with a single habitat, but it's terrific with two or more. It's terrific. Um, and so we, we have double redundancy of everything because if you, uh, you would have a toilet in a typical uh, 330, so uh, you would have a multiplicity of redundancy of everything we can think of, you can think of that you would need to keep people alive and keep them well. We also have two dissimilar, per habitats, we have two dissimilar propulsion systems. One's for ACS, one's for end of life, or a serious reboost need, because it has a lot of prop connected to it. Uh, this is, is where it's T-boned. We need a docking node and a propulsion bus that provides the intersection for these three habitats. And this comprises <clears throat> about 1,000 cubic meters. And this would require four launches of a, of a heavy version. So about 1,000 cubic meters. Uh, in comparing it to the ISS in terms of size, um, this is kind of a perspective of that. The solar rays are humongous with the ISS and the radiators, so let's just remove those. So it's kind of naked out there now. And so basically, I think the ISS has about 937 uh, cubic meters of pressurized volume, uh, somebody told me. Uh, it wasn't actually somebody, it was my granddaughter. Uh, so anyway, that's what she says, 937, and I believe her because she's never wrong. And um, we have about 1,000 in there. So the future of expandables offers the potential of being able to deploy very large systems with fewer launches, and uh, so you, you help to reduce that kind of cost out of the equation uh, in terms of the, of the total volume perspective relative to the launch costs. Uh, we also have uh, offered uh, something to, <clears throat> to the, as a response to the BAA, so we have attached the, the um, 330 to, to node two, and um, we do have the ability to, to dislocate, to, to remove ourselves, and relocate uh, and so we, we have the ability to provide that port after a period of time to another vehicle, for another vehicle. Um, and part of the cool thing here about this spacecraft, this is also, by the way, we have an acronym for this called XBASE, Expandable Bigelow Additional Station Enhancement. And Advanced Station Enhancement. And, um, and that also comes in the E version. Uh, and, and it's enterprise. And the, the X base is characterized mainly by the fact that it would be attached to the station for whatever purpose that NASA might want, including being a testing station 
would be terrific. Lots of room. And also, if NASA is really trying to promote space commercialization, then we would very much like to be doing that at the same time. So those things would be ongoing simultaneously. If NASA says, well, <clears throat> we'd like to think about using this uh, in an L1 location or a cislunar location, OK, it can remove itself. And ULA has created a, uh, an architecture that they are working on called ACES. It's a propulsion tug. So <clears throat> we would be in low Earth orbit. Uh, ACES would be in a higher uh, altitude. And it would come down, pick us up, dock to us, and shove us to L1 or Cislin or what, whatever. So we have that kind of mobility. And remember, this is an all-up station kind of environment, so it doesn't need other modules uh, to, to uh, help sustain life on board. In addition to this, they could also go to another LEO location to continue something I think is really important. I can't imagine NASA without being a national lab. I can understand trying to get rid of the, the, the lodestone on their back of the operational cost of that thing. And I really appreciate that because they're monstrous. It's huge. It's horrible. It's horrible. If, hopefully, if we're successful in the private sector community, NASA is going to save a boatload of money on even multiple locations, not just one, with more volume than they've ever had before. So it, whether it's Axiom or us or other, other people, that is the future. So they could save, cases would have a future home. It doesn't, it's not going to die as an incubator uh, for facility just because ISS is around or has changed its complexion in some way. They can have other locations at far less cost that they will have to pay a service fee for. Obviously, everybody does. And after all, there are thousands of examples of buildings in this country that are privately owned. And you have government tenants, don't you? Thousands. So it's not uncommon. It is more, actually, it, it is very common. So, so um, that probably makes an awful lot of financial sense. So I see that national labs could, could be uh, of, of many different kinds, many different uses, and in locations that may co cohab with commercial uh, functions as well. So uh, this spacecraft could relocate to one of our other habitats and function as a national lab and carry on that kind of a function, that kind of a mission. All right, so our schedule, um, we're committed, to, well, let me jump, not jump that far. We're, 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 uh, I'll save that for the, a little further along. We are very committed into a rigid structure of, of assembly and fabrication for the next four years. We function as a general contractor. We're out there looking for companies to sell us things, uh, everything from spaces to whatever. About half of what the spacecraft has, we fabricate and, and manufacture in-house, and the other half, we buy. Um, and so we have, we have a, a series of full-scale development tools that will hopefully allow us to leave our mistakes on the ground. 100A has already been built. It was a, a, a rough full-scale form and fit tool that was showed our center core from bulkhead to bulkhead. And we had, were able to get a better understanding of our current architecture as to where we would place our ECLIS systems and customer payloads and uh, air tanks, inflation tanks, and so on. Now we're going to be doing the 100B, which is a form, fit, and function tool <clears throat> that's going to be an all-up 100% hatch-to-hatch of all solid materials, whether it's aluminum or, or composites, and all of the ECLIS systems. And uh, we will also be able to use that tool for prospective customers to say, here's where your payloads can fit. We have a lot of payload capacity uh, on launch. And, and uh, so we can help customers or, or small companies that Casus is helping uh, to get to the next level. So if they're looking for sponsors and for, and, and, I, and I, I, I like that show of the valley of death or whatever that was there, yeah, that's so true. Because if you're looking to try to bridge, what kind of a bridge do you, are you going to have between what cases can offer, real flight and some money besides for small payloads to give you proof of principle, to actual destination? What does that bridge look like? And we think that our 100B could be helpful as a potential bridge and having people come into our plant, 
that are affiliated with these other aerospace companies, be they investors or, or sponsors or whatever, and we can provide some reality as to what those payloads look like full scale and how they might, may get to their destination. We also hope that NASA uses this in, in several different ways as well. Then we go to a, a 200 development series, which is flight-like. may not have rad-hardened avionics, but it's flight-like. And we can still make mistakes at that point. It's not flying. It's not going anywhere. But it's not just a hangar queen either. It's going to be used as an astronaut training tool for, to familiarize themselves with the structure. So it's a very serious, um, no kidding kind of, of very high fidelity mock-up that's going to be in our plant. Then we have some other qual units, engineering unit that uh, will be a qual unit and will actually be doing um, component testing of uh, vibe, acoustic, et cetera, because our spacecraft's too large to do an all-up kind of test like that. So we'll be doing various kinds of pressure tests on airlocks. Uh, in our, we have a 700,000 gallon uh, testing pool and we'll be doing long-term duration uh, fluctuation to pressurizing, depressurizing, and eventually burst tests on all those kinds of things. So, uh, so this, this development series gets to us to where in 2019, concurrent with this, we will be also making parts of actually flight structure for our B2330s, which we intend to ship out of our plant in 2020. I have throttled our company back and forth two or three times because of the transportation problem. So this is the first time I've ever really decided, damn it, it looks like it's close enough. It looks like it's maybe 2018, or 2018 and a half, or 2019, what the hell? But if it turns out that we're gonna be there and transportation isn't there, well then that's too damn bad for us. Because that's a commitment we have to have these two structures ready in 2020. And uh, so it will be, will be, uh, championing whoever is, is there to provide that transportation, obviously, and working the best we can with them. Uh, we do intend to probably start to talk for the very first time with prospective clients regarding deposits sometime in early 2018. And the reason for that time is that by roughly November of next year, this 100B should, should be complete. And that's going to be a very impressive tool. And we want customers to be able to see, realistically, what it is that they're going to be putting deposits on. And they may be refundable deposits for quite some time. But what it is that they're, they're talking about putting their people inside or their payloads inside. And, that, and that's our trigger mechanism for that. So I, I've probably forgotten a bunch of things. But anyway, I think that's it. OK. Thanks, Bob. You can hang on a little bit longer for some question sure. and answer session. You got a lot of uh, a lot of eager question askers in the in the audience here. Why don't we start with um, this one's gotten a lot of votes. We've had a lot of discussion earlier today about orbital debris, et cetera. Um, how well do you expect your inflatable structure to hold up to some of those impacts? And as part of that, what what uh, mechanisms are you using to measure and monitor your system right. while on orbit? So. <clears throat> Through, we've done a lot of HVI testing, hypervelocity impact testing, um, and the evidence is, is beyond doubt that uh, the expandable structure shield far su is, is significantly superior to the current aluminum hulls in terms of defending against impact, significantly better. Um, and from a radiation standpoint, they're also superior because the early information is on beam that the decimeters are reading that uh, as far as background galactic radiation is concerned, the, 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 it's much less than what the aluminum structures are encountering. And <clears throat> that has a shield that's less than 60% the, the size of a 330. Hmm. So you do want to be, from a debris standpoint, radiation standpoint, and just spatially not to go insane standpoint, inside something like the 330. Right. Well, could you could you note uh, how what kind of monitoring mechanisms you have on on the system to be able to read the how, what is the health of the structure down on the ground? Well, th 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 in terms of debris, right? In terms we of have, debris or, or just generally, we have created lots of 
uh, targets mm -hmm. with varying amounts of special kinds of materials in, so that we have a range of knowing what we want to launch and why in terms of what we can, we can stop at, at maybe 7K, you know, and better than a centimeter in, in size. Uh, and I want to get too specific on things. And from a radiation standpoint, the beam is, is our best analog for being able to get that data. Okay. Um, question here. So uh, you're a startup, but you've been here quite a while. We are so a startup. Hard... Yes, we are. Um, how does a startup afford multiple Atlas V launches? Those 552s five are, are oh, pretty penny. Horrible, yes. It's very expensive. <clears throat> We have sufficient money to do the program that I just outlined and build two or more of those spacecraft. I just talked about the B-330s. When it comes to handling the launch costs, there, my, my preference is there are two ways I'd like to handle those. Either from using clients' monies to help pay for those launch costs, we don't need anything to pay for the construction of the stations themselves. Or to get investors involved. And uh, so I'm open to that. Have, what, what kind of investors are you talking about? Is it uh, Silicon Valley? Is it international governments? We were talking about earlier with Mike. How, how you know, do you it, it, does, it, it, could be, it could be countries. It could be large companies. It could be people who aren't even affiliated with the space world. Um, but it also could be clients just by virtue of their paying for use of the structures, we would appropriate that money for the launches. Okay. I'm curious, you noted uh, people outside of the space industry, obviously your, your background is in hotels. Have you found interest in, uh, in space starting to grow from outside, from let's say your other communities that you're a part of? Uh, I, don't, I don't know as I have. I, I think, for example, the, uh, the traditional Venture capitalist community is uh, is kind of on a wait and see what's going to happen kind of mode. I think they're waiting waiting for for various communities to blink first. The the launch community is doing a lot of blinking, mm -hmm. you know. So that's really encouraging. The destination community needs to step up and make a commitment, and that's what the hell I'm doing. As we're making a commitment, right. for better or worse. From the launch community, we're happy to hear that. Thank <laughs> yeah. you very much. All right. All right. Um, Switching, switching gears a little bit uh, to the astronaut experience, how are you going to train your, train your crew? Uh, we will, uh, one structure is that we will form a separate company that will be an operating company and it will handle all of the client care mm -hmm. and everything from all the PR to the astronaut training and then we will seek out the best resources domestically that we can to put them through all that process. But they won't have to speak Russian, so there's good news <laughs> to this, right? And uh, so, so we expect to, to have to function, provide that kind of function and, uh, and, and orientation, especially if there are any kinds of onboard emergencies, basically it's like, well, get out of the way. But I, I kind of like the idea of having a little bit more training than that for them. So. Uh, they, they'll, do, they'll come be at our, our plant uh, uh, to receive that kind of training to, okay. to learn how to operate certain systems. Okay, so as a Within to be reason. I mean, there's, there's ITAR concerns. Of course. Right? We, we, are, we were first allowed as a company to have four nationals in our enclosures, but there is a limit to what we are able to tell them about how to do cer certain things. Right. If you end up having foreign foreign customers, foreign agencies, for example, have you, have you thought through what that means for them? Oh, we've had a lot of discussions with foreign country folks, and, and uh, um, we, we look forward to being part of any of their kind of space ambitions, because they want to fly. They, they have, you know, they have schools and kids, and they have entire cultures that, that have been starving, right. you know, to, to, to go forward. Right. And they want to be part of lunar ambitions or whatever, too. So those markets are real. They're out there. But it is a function of how low can you get, you know, what, how reasonable can your costs reach. 
and, and B, and you want to get those because your market's proportional as a function of, of cost. So we're very uh, sensitive to that. Excellent. Uh, I couldn't agree more. They are definitely hungry, our, our international friends. Um, this, here's a question for you. So the theme of this year is we will not stop. Mm -hmm. As noted, okay, maybe you're a startup, but as noted, you have been here, uh, you know, this is not your first ISBCS, this is not your first rodeo. Did you think it would take this long to get to this point when you uh, first jumped in? No, I didn't, because in 2000, I had a reporter ask me, well, okay, when do you think you're going to be operational? And I thought, well, I'm just going to make it really safe. So I, I told her 2015. <laughs> 2015, you know. But, uh, but not giving up is important. Um, the very first loan I ever acquired for a construction project, which I didn't even have a general contractor's license at the time, and <clears throat> back in 1970, and uh, uh, I had a friend who was going to be the general contractor, and he didn't think that I was going to get the whole project put together, including right. the loan. And I almost didn't, because I didn't get the loan until I talked to the 26th lender. Wow. So it is important not to give up. Kudos for your perseverance, both in that yeah. and also so, in getting us to this yeah. point, getting your company to that point. Um, getting back to the astronaut experience, what does the inside of your vehicle look like? Oh, boy. We have, What's that part of it like? we have a terrific virtual reality department. And it's run and operated by my granddaughter. And um, uh, we have an entertainment uh, habitat that's fabulous. Um, it's, it's, it's almost better than walking into one of the casinos. I mean, it is, it is really cool. Does it by come the with way, free drinks? Although there, are, there is, there is a, a gambling uh, uh, opportunity <laughs> inside this as well. But it has. It has, it has all kinds of things in there that is just amazing. It's amazing. Uh, we also have a, a complete VR of a manufacturing and assembly kind of situation. We have a generic one, you know, and so you can do them of hospitals or farms, um, dormitories. I mean, it depends on the reference mission that you're addressing, you know. Right, so. right. Are those available online for, for mm, not, not quite yet? yet? Okay, mm, but no. if we become a customer, we can come Absolutely. to the facility and check Absolutely. it out? Absolutely, yes. Excellent. Well, well, actually, if, you know, if you come to our plant, then we do show people certain, certain portions of this. Excellent. Well, I know you had a, there was a great piece on you guys by, uh, by CNN not so long ago, too. You got a, a nice, nice peek. Yeah. That was great exposure for you all. Um, so if, if, I'm a, if I'm a customer, uh, how do I, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you dispose of waste? What is the, the game plan for up and down mass? Okay, tell me where you are. As a, are you in Leo or in deep space? I'm in Leo. Okay. Let's start in Leo. Okay. Uh, so uh, we don't have a serious, uh, because of the magnetosphere, a serious a, a problem of radiation, except for the South Atlantic anomaly. Uh, so we will, we will return waste to Earth. Okay. If you're not there, it's a real asset. Well, so, so yeah, so let's, let's play the other scenario where we've got ULA's ACES that is... <laughs> Shoved us right. beyond, beyond All right. orbit. All right, so you want to live to get to where you want to be, right? Yes, please. That and would be nice. And <laughs> diddle for if you're on the surface of the moon. Say and we, again? Also, if, you have, if, if you're on the surface of the moon. Yes. And we have an architecture that we think is really practical to deploy these structures as a standalone base. That so, and I could describe this, but anyway, we think we have to be able to deploy them on the lunar surface or the moons of Mars. And um, so we're kind of excited about that. But all those kinds of things that you normally don't like are your friend as far as radiation is concerned. Mm -hmm. you, know, so you want as much hydrogen as you can get around you and so on. And so um, anyway, you make good use of those assets. Excellent. Bob, thank you so okay. much for your insights. It's thank always you. a pleasure to have you back. Right, Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.